HTTP smuggling is one more vulnerability that is caused by the interface of multiple systems. I'm Aaron from Security Guide Me and I want to show you how HTTP smuggling works in practice. Today I invite you to my favorite pizzeria. It's a classic Italian ristorante with a nice ambience and nice guests. But one thing is different. There are no waiters or cooks. The waiter is a robot and the cook too. Guests order via a tablet on their tables. The guests first enter how many items they want to order and then they enter their orders like a pizza and red wine. The order is forwarded to the waiter who will pass it on to the cook and he prepares the order and passes it back to the waiter. Now it's not very user-friendly to first have to enter the number of items. So they adapted the system and allowed to use a start and an end keyword. They enter their orders and they are processed by the waiter and forwarded to the cook and served by the waiter. But some guests specify the number of items and also the start and the end keyword. And this is no problem as long as all data is consistent. Then the order is entered, processed by the waiter, forwarded to the cook and served by the waiter. But what if a guest enters wrong data? Let's say he has two items and also uses the start keyword. But then he orders pizza, tiramisu and wine and says end of the order. Now the pizza operators made a mistake. The waiter waits until the end of order and forwards all items to the cook. So he prefers start and end of order over item length. However, the cook prefers item length. So he sees, oh, there are two items to prepare, sends them back to the waiter who serves them. The last item remains on the cook's to-do list. And if the next guest orders, like pizza, this item will be appended to the orphaned item and the additional item will be delivered to another guest. Serving additional items only works if items are also available in the kitchen. If somebody would like to order horse apples for another guest, the cook will say, oh, we do not have any. Let's see how we can detect such a desync attack between the waiter and the cook. We could create an order with an item length of 3, then say start and add only 2 items. Then the waiter will forward the order as soon as he hits end of order. But the cook will wait and wait and wait for the third item because he relies on the item length. And so the order will arrive late or even not at all. Let's have a look how this works for HTTP. If a browser sends a POST request to a server, the browser also sends some data. It must somehow say where the data ends. And there are two options. The first option is to specify the HTTP header transfer encoding chunked. In this case, the server expects a number holding the length of the next chunk, carriage return a new line, and then the data. The next number, again, says how many bytes the next chunk holds. And our data ends here, so we say zero. The second option is to specify the content length header with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 bytes. When this data is sent to a server system that consists of a front-end and a back-end server, there might be a desynchronization what header is preferred. The specification says that if there is a transfer encoding header set, the server must ignore the content length header. But not all web servers are implemented this way, so desynchronizations happen. In this case, the front-end server, our waiter, prefers the transfer encoding header. It waits for the last chunk, the zero and forwards it to the backend. And the backend prefers, against the standard, the content length and processes until there. 
If we now want to craft a malicious request, we could append another request, like get malicious, adapt the chunk length and send it. And then we of course add a carriage return in the new line and a zero because here our data ends. The front-end server will process the complete request and the back-end server stops processing after the content length is reached. The rest of the request, which is our malicious request, remains in the back-end server buffer. The next user who sends a request that is passed on to that backend server will get our malicious request prepended. It looks like he sent the guest request to malicious and the server will prepare the response accordingly. Maybe a 404 not found page. To successfully exploit the HTTP smuggling attack, the website must provide some functionality uh, that we can exploit, like posting comments to a board or other vulnerabilities like cross-site scripting or open redirects or so. Because otherwise it would be like uh, ordering horse apples. I will now show you how to practically exploit the smuggling attack. I will use a lab from the Portsburger Web Academy therefore and I also already started a lab and I will go to burp now and open a browser. This is the integrated Chromium browser and look if it starts. Here we go and visit our lab URL. Here we get the intercept. I let the requests go through. Now we have a blog here and we have several posts and let's view a post. And here we have some comments uh, and we can now just leave a comment like test and test at example.com and website is https example.com. I will intercept that uh, request, say post, and here we get the post request containing a cross set request forgery token, the post ID, uh, our comment, our name, and so on. And we have several uh, several HTTP headers that are that we don't need, and that I will remove therefore. This is just noise that we don't need. And I will send that using control R to the repeater. And here we go, we, here we have it. If I would send that now, I would expect the comment to appear on the board uh, containing ABC. Now, I, I already installed via the burp extender, the B app, store uh, the HTTP request smuggler. And if I now go to our request in the repeater, I retain the original request here. We can also name it original post. Uh, and here in the second copy, we go to extensions, HTTP request smuggler, request smuggler, and we can click smuggle, smuggle probe and just use the default settings. Going back to the extender, we go to the tab extensions and here we uh, choose the request smuggler and the output and here we say, see that uh, one attack was queued and now we are uh, waiting for a response and we scroll up here and here it says already unexpected report with response, found issue, possible HTTP request smuggling, CLTE. CL stands for content length, TE for transfer encoding. From that output, we uh, know that the front end server probably expects or prefers the content length header, and the back end server uh, prefers the transfer encoding header. If it would be TECL, it would be the other way around. And what does Burp tell us now? Burp issued a request and got a response. And then issued the same request but with a shorter content length and got a timeout. This suggests that the front end system is using the content length header and the back end is using the transfer encoding chunked header. You should be able to manually verify this using the repeater. We try this. We go to the logger to see 
what requests were sent by the extender. And in that column, we see start response timer. Uh, and we see that here we got a quick response of 130 uh, milliseconds. And here we, it, we had a, a request that took 10 seconds. So here we got a timeout. And we also see this in response server error communication timed out. I go to that request and also again send it to the repeater. Here we go. Here it says transfer encoding chunked uh, with unexpected uppercase characters. This is done because the specification says if there is a transfer encoding header, the content length header must be ignored. But uh, they somehow try to uh, mask this transfer encoding header by using uppercase characters or also uh, adding an X here or so. And then uh, the attacker hopes that one system uh, interprets this as a transfer encoding header, the other system does not. And so one system says, oh, there was a transfer encoding header and the other says, uh, the other system says there was no transfer encoding header. And so they get into a desync condition. We could now send this and I, uh, I'm quite sure that there will be an, uh, an, a timeout again. Uh, here the content length is 138 uh, and this is probably more. So selection is 140. So the content length header is shorter. If I would send it now, the content length header would be automatically updated to 140 by the repeater. And therefore we need to go to repeater and uncheck that option update content length header. So here is no tick now and if I send it now I'm expecting a timeout as it was uh, or, or as it occurred for the extender tool. And so we get the same error, we get a timeout. Uh, so we, I believe that there is this vulnerability there. We can now update the content length automatically, just, okay, it's 144 bytes, and we did not get a timeout. It's only an invalid request. And using this request now, we try to smuggle uh, a request. So we go to extensions, request smuggler, and now, because we have both headers, the content length and the transfer encoding header present in our uh, request, we can here now choose smuggle attack. And we will try this. And now the turbo intruder opens. And there is already a predefined script that tries to inject the request to get the robots.txt. Um, let's have a look at uh, the website, what we find at robots.txt. We find nothing, we get a 404 not found. Uh, so if we now try to smuggle this request and successfully inject it to the back end and the subsequent request results to a 404, then we have probably successfully smuggled that request. So we use the default settings here, click attack and wait for uh, the Turbo Intruder to start and to send its requests. And here I can already press Halt, row zero. We see that <clears throat> this was our request and here the request smuggler smuggled the get request and the directly subsequent uh, post request that was equal to the previous one resulted in a 404 because the robots.txt was not found uh, and it was obviously successfully smuggled to the back end. So now we confirmed this vulnerability. I now again send this request to the repeater and now we want to try uh, to, to, we want to smuggle something useful. I again verify that the update content length uh, option is ticked. I, we now need it to be updated automatically. 
uh, and here we send uh, a comment, okay, we send a post request, but we need to smuggle another useful request. And I now go back to the original post that we made and copy that and replace this get request by our post request. So this is our post that we want or, or our request that we want to smuggle to the backend. We also smuggle our session cookie because we want the next user uh, to post a comment in our name containing his web request. So I use that comment.abc and cut it here and put it to the end because, and I also delete that abc. What I expect now is that we smuggle this request to the backend. The next user who sends a request and that arrives also the same backend server gets this post request prepended to his own request. So let's say he makes a get request to the page, but the backend server thinks he just issued a post request containing our cookie sending a valid comment. And I put the comment to the last place because his get request will be appended to our post request. And now we expect that if we smuggle this request, uh, that, the, that the next user's request will be publicly posted to that blog post. And I think that everything should be fine here. Yeah, this, is, this may be an option. Uh, so we have the content length of 127. So uh, here we have 124 bytes because it was ABC before. So it was 127. Uh, and this needs to be longer because it needs to hold the complete request of the next user. And so I just enter 800 here and this content length must be updated automatically by the, by the repeater because uh, we want the front end who processes the content length header uh, to forward the whole request to the backend server to have our request smuggled. And now we send and it says 302 found. So uh, we also posted something to that board and now we have to wait. We have to wait until the next user visits the site. And of course it's a lab, but Burp does issue uh, requests by a bot constantly in the background. And we go back to our lab to see if there were some new comments. And here we see that our user really posted a get request to the board containing a cookie and a secret that we could reuse to impersonate that user. It is quite difficult and cumbersome to detect HTTP smuggling. And uh, I work for a project uh, which is called Offensity, which is a continuous vulnerability scanner where we can detect such attacks very easily. And uh, we do continuous scanning to detect this and many, many more vulnerabilities. So you might want to check it out. This is how HTTP request smuggling or desync attacks work. And I hope you understood this issue and you learned a bit. If you liked my video, you might want to subscribe to my channel and see you next time. Bye bye.